You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. This monograph emphasizes still the least restrictive and the presumption of innocence and all the constitutional principles that are so important to pretrial. Right up front it says that the uh, person who interviews the uh, newly arrested person gives the first impression of the system. With pretrial, you have to be least restrictive and at the same time ensure that the community is protected. Hopefully, in, a, in almost all districts at this point, the officers are out actually in the community doing supervision. But I think the additional factor is that the officers are going to have to have a reason for, for having contacts with the offenders. There's a real emphasis on establishing a partnership between management and the officer. And that partnership uh, involves coaching, involves staffing, involves collaborating. I think if a chief is behind closed doors, his supervisors or her supervisors are going to be the same way. And, and it's not going to work that way. I think that the old days of just counting uh, who, who spent the most time in the field is uh, finally gone by the wayside. Welcome to the broadcast. Today we provide you with an introduction to Monograph 111, which governs the supervision of federal defendants. In a moment, we'll be joined by a distinguished panel of pretrial services officers and managers from the field. Um, and keep in mind that the program is designed to highlight the major changes in the monograph uh, and to demonstrate later on through some role plays that we'll do uh, how some of those changes will impact pretrial supervision. So stay with us. Um, we've got an interesting show for you today. Uh, and before we get to the meat and potatoes of it, I wanted to turn the program briefly over to AO Assistant Director John Hughes of the Office of Probation and Pretrial Services, who will introduce the monograph. On behalf of Director Meekum, I am pleased to introduce the new monograph 111, the supervision of federal defendants. Over three years of effort have been invested by the Pretrial Services Committee of an ad hoc supervision work group appointed by Director Meekum in January 2000. The group sought input from every district, from officers, supervisors, deputies, specialists, and chiefs as to best practices in pretrial services supervision, and also looked into recent research into what works in terms of achieving desired supervision outcomes. We now have a supervision monograph that preserves and builds on what was good and right about the original 111. It brings a new focus on pretrial services as the front door of a broader community justice system and describes how pretrial services can carry out its unique mandate in a way that facilitates the goals of safety and fairness shared with other elements of the system. The monograph also promotes continuity of services and reduces duplication of effort. And most importantly, the monograph defines the desired outcomes and principles of effective supervision. I started out in this system as a pretrial services officer, and I appreciate the importance of striking a balance between the presumption of innocence and individual liberty on one hand, with concerns about whether the defendant will return to court or present a danger to the community on the other hand. That balancing act is often very difficult, and it is our hope at the administrative office that this monograph will make the job a little easier or at least a little clearer. On behalf of Director Meekum, I want to say that the administrative office is committed to providing the technical assistance and tools required to fully implement the principles of this monograph, now and in the future. Thank you. Now, bear in mind that Monograph 111, like the new Monograph 109, and the Charter for Excellence embrace the view of an officer as a professional. So there's a corresponding emphasis on the officer's ability to use professional judgment and frankly a corresponding de-emphasis on the officer's ability to fill out boxes on a form. Um, now in terms of this first segment, our purpose here is just to provide an overview 
of the monograph's content and to highlight its differences from the previous version. Uh, to do that, I'd like to introduce our panelists, both here in the studio and on the telephone. First, from the District of New Mexico, Steve Skinner, the supervising U.S. Pretrial Services Officer. Steve, welcome. Thank you. From the also from the District of New Mexico, Chief U.S. Pretrial Services Officer, Hens Williams. Hens, welcome. Uh, from the Western District of New York, Tony San Giacomo, Deputy Chief Probation Officer. Welcome. welcome. And Last but not least in the studio, U.S. Pretrial Services Officer Penny Wickenheiser from the District of Minnesota. Penny, welcome. Thank you. On the telephone, we are joined from New York City by Dennis Spitzer, Chief U.S. Pretrial Services Officer in the Southern District of New York. Hello, Dennis. Hello, Mark. Uh, from Dallas, Texas, Deputy Chief uh, U.S. Pretrial Services Officer Jolene Witten. Hi, Jolene. Hello, Mark. From West Palm Beach, Florida, Supervising U.S. Pretrial Services Officer Nancy Colon of the Southern District of Florida. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Mark. Uh, and from Salt Lake City, Utah, Tristan Smart, uh, Supervising U.S. Probation Officer uh, for the Pretrial Unit uh, in the District of Utah. Hi, Tristan. Hi, Mark. Welcome all. Um, now, let's talk, let's begin at the beginning here with Chapter 1 of the monograph. Um, and the first chapter sets the tone for pretrial supervision and covers several topics. Um, one of those topics is the philosophy of pretrial supervision. And first, I'd like to go to Jolene uh, in Dallas. And Jolene, describe the philosophy for us of the monograph. And if you could, highlight some of those differences between the philosophy undergirding the new monograph and that that was present uh, with the previous version, Publication 111. Well, Mark, I wouldn't say that the philosophy in our new monograph is new in a sense. Basically, what I think our new monograph does is state clearly what those of us in pretrial services have always felt to be true about our role in this agency and about our role in the supervision of defendants. Um, one thing that will always remain the same is the idea that John Hughes referred to that we must always create a balance between individual liberty and community safety. We have to keep in mind the presumption of innocence while we promote public safety through our supervision practices. But really, pretrial services is the front door to the federal criminal justice system. We're the first before the courts, before the Bureau of Prisons, before probation that these defendants have contact with. And we have an opportunity to impact how successful the defendant will be, even at the later stages of the process. So as it says in our new monograph 111, we don't want that front door to become a revolving door. We really want to impact the lives of the defendants that we supervise. So we have a unique opportunity to lay a foundation for defendant's future success. And we do that several ways. One is through our professional ethics. For example, if pretrial services treats people with dignity and respect, then the defendant is more likely to expect that same treatment later from, say, a caseworker at the Bureau of Prisons or a probation officer. And that may influence the defendant's behavior um, with, with those agencies. Again, if we act with integrity, then the defendant may expect um, the same kind of behavior from the individuals in the later processes. Um, also, throughout the supervision process, if the defendant knows that his pretrial services officer has certain expectations and will follow through if the defendant doesn't meet those expectations, then they're more likely to believe there will be consequences at later stages in the federal criminal justice system. So as you said, we set the tone, so to speak, for the entire system. And that um, brings to mind our supervision process or practices um, we all know that in pretrial services, it's not our function to rehabilitate. However, um, even though we're designed simply or basically to address the risks of non-appearance and danger, we can also have a secondary impact and a more lasting effect um, in that we do influence a defendant's future choices. An example provided in the 111 is a defendant who decides to quit abusing substances because of his experiences while under pretrial supervision. Um, that decision made by the defendant may have far-reaching effects beyond the period of pretrial supervision and can influence not only the defendant, but his family and his community. In doing all that, we also have partnerships with other agencies, um, 
which can be instrumental in effective supervision of defendants. We can work with the Bureau of Prisons, with US, U.S. probation, or even community resource agencies. So we can increase our effectiveness in impacting the future success of the defendant through our supervision. Excellent. Thank you, Jolene. Uh, I want to come back to some of the points that you made about philosophy, but I now want to talk with Hence Williams. Hence, one of the other uh, topics covered in Chapter 1, still on Chapter 1, uh, in, of the monograph uh, is desired outcomes. Uh, describe some of the, or describe all of those desired outcomes and, and, and sort of how they differ, if at all, from the previous version, Publication 111. Well, it isn't a difference. It, in fact, it's the same thing. Okay. The desired outcomes are that the defendant appears before the court and not commit new crimes. That is what pretrial is about. Uh, it is said by statute that those are the requirements for success. We, in this new monograph, believe that that success should not be just during the pretrial period, although that's basically all we're required to do. We believe that its successful supervision will follow this person throughout the process. Our desired outcomes become that long-term history, not just you know, the six to ten months that this person is involved with the courts prior to any kind of sentencing. Uh, our hope is that the defendant will successfully complete the supervision period, that they will obey all laws, uh, not be re-arrested for new behavior, uh, comply with all the conditions of supervision. Uh, hopefully learning from that how to readjust their lives to, to carry them beyond the period of supervision, both uh, pretrial and post-conviction supervision, should that occur, and make their required appearances before court. Those are the desired outcomes. There may be risks involved with this defendant that go beyond the conditions of release, which we also have to address, and those may be the factors which will help this person uh, not come back before the court. Okay, so let's let's hold it there uh, and go over to Tony San Giacomo. Tony, uh, take what um, Jolene has described in terms of the philosophy, what Hens has talked about in terms of uh, desired outcomes, and talk to us about sort of the supervision model. You know that the monograph puts forth. There's a graphic representation in Chapter 1 of that supervision model. Uh, we have a represent that representation that will appear on the screen for the field and talk about how some of those concepts sort of, we've talked about a lot of things, how they uh, interact with each other in this supervision model. Well, the model itself is really a blueprint for officers to follow and the foundation of that model, if you see on the screen, is really the conditions of release and that's really uh, where everything works out from. And as you move up the model, you see that we have a monitor and those would be our monitoring strategies. Uh -huh. And for example, a uh, defendant who is employed and part of his condition is to maintain employment, a monitoring strategy would be to um, maybe get some pay stubs to verify that they are, they are maintaining employment. Okay. As you work up the model, you see, uh, hence just described the desired outcomes. And our I mean, desired outcome is that the defendant uh, lead a law-abiding life and attend court hearings as directed. As you work your way down the model, you look at the assisting, which is also a very important function of, of a pretrial and probation officer performing pretrial duties. Assisting, if we look at the employment again as a condition, uh, if, a, if a defendant has a condition to seek um, and obtain employment, you would assist by referring that defendant for employment services and maybe even resume counseling. And really, another very important piece is if you look inside the model, you can see this is an ongoing cycle, and we're looking at investigating, assessing, um, planning, implementing, evaluating, and within that, it's all around managing risk. We've, we've animated the inside of that model in our graphic because we really think that that's an important thing for folks to get and sort of is one of the linchpins to understanding the philosophy here, which is a constant type of assessment, not a one-shot deal, not we're going to assess this person and that's all we're going to do and then we're going to move on to something else. We're going, it's, we're going to be constantly, we're going to be proactive here. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind when we are thinking about the differences between the new approach and the old approach. Yeah, I mean, you know, no one is frozen in time and we have to continue right. to assess a case and that's important. Now, I mean, there are different, different cases call for different levels of interaction and proactivity, but bottom line is that there should be a minimal degree of 
at least a minimal degree of proactivity, and that's the mindset, that has to be the mindset of the officer. Yeah, and I think, you know, staying along the lines of least restrictive conditions, we also have to look at the strategies, and the strategies need to be proportionate to the risk. Okay. And that's important. Good. All right. Um, now, Dennis Spitzer, a New York City chief in the uh, Southern District of New York, uh, we're still in Chapter 1. Chapter 1's important, folks. Um, talk to us about the uh, principles of effective supervision, again, articulated in Chapter 1. What are those principles? What do they mean? How do they uh, correspond with what our other panelists have been saying? Sure, Mark. The Ad Hoc Working Group early on identified five principles of effective supervision, which are individualized, purposeful, multidimensional, attentive to changes, proactive in implementation, and responsive to changes. <clears throat> when implemented, these principles will assist in achieving the desired outcomes of having the defendant obey the law, incurring no new arrest while he's on bail, appearing in court when required, and complying with all other re release conditions, all of which will result in the successful completion of the term of supervision by the defendant. So let's take a look at each of the principles for a brief description. The effective supervision as individualized in that it's tailored to the risk presented by the individual defendant. It's responsive to the requirements of the individual case rather than the implementation of any standard supervision plan or, or strategy. It's purposeful in that the supervision plan should develop objectives to be accomplished during a period of supervision and every supervision activity should have a purpose directly related to these objectives. It's multidimensional in the sense that cases that present multiple issues require the implementation of multiple strategies. And it's attentive to changes and proactive in, in implementation that offices need to be aware of changes in the defendant's circumstances. And they do that through office, community, and collateral contacts. Collateral contact specifically with third-party custodians and co-signers, uh, treatment pr uh, plan providers, as well as significant others. It said if you know three people who know the defendant, then you know the defendant, and that's, and that's our goal. And finally, responsive to changes, as, as offices are aware of changes in the defendant's circumstances, they must respond by adjusting the level of supervision to address the current level of risk. We're seeking bail modifications to the conditions of risk, of risk to, to identify that risk and ad address it. Conversely, if a defendant is meeting his objectives in consultation with the supervisor, the officer should consider reducing the monitoring activities and may even consider removing the condition, requesting the removal of the condition of supervision. In conclusion, the effective supervision practices can assist in reducing unnecessary detention and having a positive impact for the defendant as well as the community. Excellent. Thank you, Dennis. I think one of the, uh, I, I like to highlight one of the words you used as you were going through the effective, uh, the principles of effective supervision, and that is proactive. We already had mentioned that, that word when we were talking about the supervision model and what we were trying to represent in that animated uh, part of that supervision model that folks saw on the screen. Again, it's, it's that emphasis on being community oriented, being proactive, getting out into the community, knowing the defendant, and, and, and knowing ab about the defendant. Um, and I think that's sort of a key, again, in the direction of this monograph as opposed to, the, to, to its uh, predecessor. Um, moving right along, uh, that does it for Chapter 1. Chapter 2, the monograph describes supporting roles, um, which we'll refer to in our next segment when we do the role plays. So uh, we're going to skip that for the time being. And Chapter 3 simply uh, lays out the conditions of release. Uh, no big changes there. So uh, we're going to skip that as well and move directly to Chapter 4, where uh, assessment and, and the assessment and planning process is covered. Uh, and at this point, I want to go to Nancy Colon, supervisor in the Southern District of Florida. Nancy, what are the highlights and major differences between the new 111 and old 111 in terms of the assessment and planning process? Well, there are four critical points that we need to address when we're talking about the assessment and planning process of the new monograph. The first is that the monograph emphasizes on the initial assessment investigation. 
Second is that the monograph uh, also provides for a three-tiered assessment process, which I'll explain in detail in a few minutes. Uh, the third point is that uh, the monograph shifts supervision, the supervision focus from activities to outcomes. And then finally, the monograph fosters a professional and collaborative planning process while reducing unnecessary paperwork. Now, when we're talking about the initial assessment investigation, this is the stage in which the officers will gather information, assess uh, risk factors, uh, develop the initial supervision plan. Uh, this plan is to be submitted for review to the supervisor within 30 calendar days of the defendant's release. So this is a major change from Publication 111, which only allowed for the 10-day period to complete this process. Now, during the, this 30-day period, uh, the officers are required to review all available documentation to conduct the post-release intake interview of the defendant uh, to do a home inspection of the defendant's residence uh, to develop and contact collateral sources such as family members, employers. Also, at this stage, officers will implement or take steps to implement implement directives such as drug testing, uh, referrals for evaluations, uh, treatment, um, excuse me. So as you can see, this is a period of a lot of activity on the part of uh, the officer in order to learn more about the defendant. Um, this period also emphasizes on the ongoing um, need for continuous assessment that is so important for effective supervision. Uh, which brings me to the second point, um, and that is that the monograph provides for a three-tiered uh, risk assessment process, and this includes the use of the risk prediction index, uh, known as the RPI. Uh, it also requires officers to identify specific targeted risk factors, such as mental health, uh, history of violence, uh, immigration issues, issues that are not necessarily included in the RPI, but that may present a risk uh, for supervision. Uh, once these factors have been identified, the next step is to assess whether they present a reasonable foreseeable risk of danger to another person or to specific individuals. So what we're talking about here is any risk of physical or financial harm to a specific person. Uh, the third point is that the monograph shifts the supervision focus from activities to outcomes. Um, with the old monograph, officers are required to uh, specify number of contacts or activities, for example, quarterly home contacts, um, quarterly employment contacts. So oftentimes officers and supervisors find themselves counting these activities rather than assessing why they are important or what do they actually accomplish. Uh, so with the new monograph, uh, sh the focus is shifted away from counting these activities and, and uh, it, pl it places greater emphasis on the outcome. Uh, the goal of the monograph is to have the officers develop reasonable objectives for the defendants to complete um, during the period of uh, supervision, and uh, these objectives or goals are to be developed in collaboration with the office specialist and the supervisor, which brings me to the last point um, that uh, the monograph fosters a professional and collaborative planning process while reducing unnecessary paperwork. Um, as you know, the old way of reviewing files consists of officers completing the supervision plan review, um, submitting the plan along with the complete case file to the supervisor. Uh, then the supervisor will review the file, write comments on the um, case file audit form or the SPR, and then returning the file back to the officer with very little face-to-face -face interaction. So the monograph replaces that paperwork review process with a face-to-face -face meeting between the officer and the supervisor to discuss uh, the case and to update the plan. Um, the goal here is to save time, to reduce paperwork, to enhance professionalism, and to promote a collaborative exchange. Excellent. Thank you very much, Nancy. Those, there are several things uh, in what you said that I want people to make at least a mental note of because you're going to see a lot of that when we do our role plays in the next segment. 
Um, we only have about five minutes left in this segment before we move to the role plays. So Tristan Smart in Utah, let me ask you to quickly uh, summarize Chapter 5 for us, and then we'll come back here to the studio, and we'll have Penny and Steve talk about uh, what's happening in Chapter 6. Chapter 5 uh, deals with uh, selecting and executing strategies. So Tristan, why don't you take us through that? Okay. The main points in Chapter 5 are, first, that it provides guidance on implementing supervision strategies. It organizes conditions set forth in statute by topic area. It contains information regarding the purpose of each condition, as well as implementation and monitoring strategies. It includes new and expanded topics on search and seizure. And finally, it separates routine supervision activities from more intensive activities. Okay, let me uh, cut in there. And Is there any sort of specific thing that you feel needs to be emphasized among those points. I know there's a lot there, but what to you, in your experience, um, is the, you know, needs to be emphasized? Well, I think under the point of um, providing guidance on implementing supervision strategies, uh -huh. it emphasizes the officers need to um, develop a variety of both monitoring and assisting strategies. Um, and then the monograph goes on to give definitions of monitoring and assisting strategies. Um, I think that the, uh, the section about um, the search and seizure and um, mm -hmm. plain view mm -hmm. is particularly important because right. these are often contentious issues in a variety of districts. And that's a new thing for, for pretrial services and, and I think in many districts a controversial thing. Correct. And, and it is new in this monograph and, and I think it's important to point out quickly that the monograph does indicate that there's no explicit authority in Title 18 for a condition of pretrial release that permits warrantless searches and seizures. However, our officers are allowed, um, according to district policy, to um, continue with plain view seizures. Very good. Thanks very much. Um, now quickly, uh, Chapter 6 talks about managing noncompliant behavior. Uh, again, we'll see uh, some of this when we move to the second segment. But Penny and Steve, let me ask you guys to uh, briefly summarize what's in that chapter. Penny, why don't you take the first couple of points, and then Steve will take the, the last point. Thanks, Mark. Sure, thank you. Chapter 6 stresses, stre um, stresses the importance of officers using the two-pronged approach of risk control and risk reduction interventions when managing noncompliant behavior. Risk control invent inter uh, in interventions, uh -huh. sorry, That's hold working. the defendant accountable for their noncompliant behavior and let the defendant know that future noncompliance will not be tolerated and will have negative consequences. Risk reduction interventions address the individual needs of the defendant and offer assistance to that defendant in obtaining treatment, employment, whatever is needed to alleviate or prevent future noncompliance. Risk control and risk reduction interventions should be used simultaneously, not separately, and the ultimate goal is to bring about positive change in the defendant's lifestyle. Okay, talk about the, the combination and the guidance that the, the monograph provides regarding combined responses or approaches. The monograph provides an advisory framework for officers to receive suggestions, generates ideas and ways for officers to deal with noncompliance. It sets forth this in areas of risk, um, the two-pronged approach of risk control and risk reduction interventions. And it, it's, it's just a suggestion framework for officers. It's not a you have to type of thing, but it does give ideas from low to high risk violations. Very good. One of the things yeah, I wanted to just tell add on that, um, Mark, is that we really want to move away from this no action mentality. And hopefully, as you can see throughout the monograph, this is really trying to raise the bar of supervision in pretrial services. Absolutely. And I think that a lot of what we've talked about from the first chapter now through the last chapter gets that across, you know, that proactivity is expected, community orientation is expected, doing something is expected, not letting sleeping dogs lie because they don't sleep for very long. They don't. Uh, <laughs> good. Quickly, Steve, last point. Okay. Uh, the last point here is that it emphasizes the need to tailor responses the circumstances of the defendant and the context in, in which the non-compliant behavior occurred. This is, is the notion that the cookie cutter approach doesn't work and that responses and interventions to non-compliant behavior need to be tailored to the specific defendant, his previous history, his current case, his current level of compliance with supervision, all those things wrapped into one. What 
probably doesn't work with this is the policies that many districts have, which are graduated sanctions that specify if a person does A, B, or C, then they get this sanction. Uh, they're going to be tailorized under this model. Okay. Look, we're off to a good start. Off and running. We got to get out. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, folks on the phone, uh, sit tight. Uh, it's time to move for our, to our next segment so we can show you uh, some of the things we've been talking about, actually demonstrate a few of the practices we've been referring to so you can see how it might look uh, and what, what the change really uh, will look like. Um, my colleague, Kate Linett, is currently making the rounds among circuits doing circuit-wide supervisors training. So those of you in the field who are supervisors may have already received some training on the new 111 and the new 109. Um, and you may have uh, already been exposed to some of this information. You'll notice that there's a greater emphasis on the proactivity of the supervisor in this new monograph. But even if you've been exposed to some of that training already, we thought it would be helpful for those of you in the field to see uh, uh, or to hear about and to see some of the programs that the FJC makes available for supervisors so you can continue in your professional development. So take a look at this message, and we'll be back in a couple of minutes with our role plays. Monograph 111 indicates the supervisor's specific roles in the supervision process are to oversee the application of principles established by law and policy in each case, and to work in partnership with officers to translate these principles into action, develop the professional skills of their officers, and facilitate the supervision function in their districts. The monograph requires supervisors and officers to collaborate in case planning and evaluation, and notes that the supervisor's role in this process is to serve as mentor and professional colleague to the officer. To assist supervisors in fulfilling this critical role, the Federal Judicial Center offers several educational resources. The Supervisors Development Program is a self-directed 90-hour program that requires completion within three years and leads to a certificate of achievement. For more information on this program, visit the Center's intranet site on the DCN or call 202-502-4100. We also offer other materials touching on such issues as communication, leadership, and employee relations. For more information on these, consult The Purple Book, Programs and Services for Federal Court Personnel, available on the Center's DCN intranet site, or by calling 202-502-4110. We regularly offer training for supervisors on the Federal Judicial Television Network. Recently televised programs have addressed motivating staff, leadership skills, and ethical decision-making. Many of our FJTN programs qualify for credit in the Supervisor's Development Program. You can stay updated on these programs with the FJTN Bulletin, published bi-monthly by the Center and available on our DCN intranet site. Programs are also announced in our monthly column in News and Views. Let us help you with your professional development. Contact us soon. Welcome to the set of United States versus James Jones. Um, what we're going to do in this segment is illustrate through some role plays the practices, or some of the practices, that we've been talking about in the first segment. Um, our focus is going to be uh, on, a, on a few discrete practices. Uh, first, we'll look at the assessment investigation and where the emphasis should be placed there. And then in our second act, uh, we'll move on to the six-month supervision plan evaluation. Um, since all supervision takes place in the context of an actual case, our panelists, who are also part of this program's planning group, have put together their combined experience and developed a scenario uh, for, uh, to sort of serve as the backdrop for some of the practices we're going to be demonstrating. Uh, this, as I said at the beginning of the segment, is the case of United States versus James Jones. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about our defendant. Uh, Jones is a 20-year-old white male, and he's been charged with one count of possession with intent to distribute marijuana. He's unemployed, but has held a series of fast food and construction jobs, and he has a GED. He has a, a DWI in his background, and he's completed successfully his probation for that. 
Um, and we know that he's used marijuana since he was 14 years old. Jones lives with his father uh, and has been released on bond with his father serving as the third party custodian. And Jones also has a substance abuse treatment condition. Now, as I said, our first act is going to focus on the assessment investigation. And our methodology here is going to be comparing the old approach to doing things with the new approach to doing things so that you'll be able in your districts to discuss it and compare and contrast for yourselves you know, what you like and what you don't like. Um, and serving as our officer uh, throughout our role plays is going to be Steve Skinner. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and soon we'll be bringing on Tony San Giacomo, who will be playing the role of the supervisor for our, um, for our role plays as well. Now, uh, in the first scene of this act focusing on assessment investigation, um, Steve is the officer, and he makes an unannounced visit to the defendant's home, to James Jones's residence. Uh, he knocks on the door and waits for a response. Mr. Jones, are you home? No response. So Steve, why don't you come on over, take a seat there. Now, having gotten no response when, after he knocked on the door and did his little knock and announce, uh, left his business card wisely. Steve is now back at the office, and the defendant, pursuant to the number on the business card, calls uh, Steve while he's sitting at his desk. The telephone rings. Free trial to Steve. Mr. Jones. Yeah, I appreciate you calling me back. You get, you did get my card. Great. Are you living at that 1155 Main Street address? Okay. Listen, I need you to stop by my office and uh, drop off uh, some sort of bill or uh, utility bill, water bill, something like that, with your name on it. I'd like you to do it as soon as possible. Tomorrow after work would be fine. Okay. Great. That works. Thanks. Good. Address verified, and I got it done within 10 days. Beautiful. Steve, why don't you uh, stand up and come out here. Tony, let me ask you to come on the set, please. And you guys just have a, you know, just sort of stand right there. And we're going to change the set here before we move on to the next role play. Now, that's the old way of doing things, assessment investigation. Tony, let me get your reaction. What works there or what doesn't work? What's sort of wrong with that picture? Uh, I think clearly it's not the most effective way to really um, assess safety issues okay. and also uh, demystify our role in the process, which okay. is very important uh, for the defendant and, and other uh, individuals living at the residence. Okay. Uh, Steve, let me get, get your officer's perspective. I mean, until recently you were a line officer. I mean, that worked for you? It was the minimum standard. It was something that you could document in your ICSP that, uh -huh. that you had completed the residence verification. It did not, however, uh, give you a lot of information to go by as you went along with supervision and uh, dealt with noncompliance issues later. Okay. So now let's take a look at the new way of doing things. Um, and what I'd like to do is to have uh, my colleagues from the FJC, Chris Wagenseller and Bob Fagan, come on. If you guys could just sort of take your p some positions here. Don't sit down. Just stand up. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Thanks for being here. It's a familiar position for you, Bob, I know. I've done a few. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, now, Chris, you are our wayward defendant, uh, James Jones. Correct. And suffice it to say, you're uh, getting a little freaked out at being involved in the criminal justice system. But uh, you know, you're sort of just waking up as to what's actually going on here. Bob, you're his, you're his stand-up dad, you know. Uh, you're a good guy. You're disappointed with what's going on. You're kind of upset about what's going on. This is your motivation. Very uh, disappointed in him. Right. You know, you know his history. He's never sort of been the kind of kid that you wanted him to be. And, and suffice it to say, also, he's probably a little disappointed with you too, Dad. Okay? So this is really where we're going and what we're talking about here. Now, um, in this scene, uh, Steve, again, is the officer. Tony is the supervisor. This is the home assessment. This is that home assessment that the monograph is referring to. We're going to act it out here. Now, you've come to the residence. 
and you introduce yourselves to the defendant, or you reintroduce yourselves, I should say, particularly you, Steve, to the defendant and his father. Why don't you guys go ahead and play it out? How you doing, Jim? Uh, all right, officer. How are you? Good. This is uh, Tony Sanjay Como. He's my yeah. supervisor. He's going right. to go through the house and do the home inspection with me. All right. Okay. We talked about this on the phone, but I just want to make sure that your uh, pit bull is put somewhere. He's, he's locked in the basement. Good. We had a we had an officer bit last year, and I just want to make sure that you know the dogs aren't running around biting no. me and Tony. I understand. Is this your dad? Uh, yeah. How you Hi, doing? Hi, Mr. Jones. How you doing? Steve Skinner. Nice, nice to meet you, Como. My nice supervisor, to Tony. Nice Andrew to meet you. Como. Good. And um, we're here to meet with you and talk to you and, and Jim uh, about Jim's obligation under pretrial release and your obligation, sir, as a third-party custodian in this matter. Okay. But first, we want to walk through the house. Okay. Take now, a look around. Now, does that mean you're going to have to look through all the bedrooms and everything? Sir, we're, we are going to walk around the house and walk in, in the rooms. We won't be looking in closets or digging through your drawers or any of your personal effects. Okay. Now, I noticed uh, some beer bottles outside the house when we walked in. Uh, have you been drinking at all? Uh, no, not me. The neighbors had a party over the weekend. I tried to clean it all up, but I, uh, I might have missed some. Okay. All right. Well, we, Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, we, we don't want to take up a whole lot of your time this afternoon, but we do want to sit down and talk and, and explain all the responsibilities uh, of the third party custodian and, uh, and more importantly, you, Jimmy. You know, have a seat. Okay, so the uh, walkthrough has occurred, introductions or reintroductions have occurred. We're back in the living room. The defendant and his father, well, everybody's seated with the exception of. The supervisor, now two questions, Tony. First, what the heck are you doing here? Is the expectation now going to be under the new monograph that the supervisor is going to go with the officer on every home assessment? Absolutely not. Okay. But uh, the expectation is, is that the supervisor and the officer will work more closely together, and that will entail some field work together. And in this case, this happens to be a field day where um, Steve is, going, is doing a, a home assessment. Okay, so we just wanted to illustrate that this will happen from time to time. And again, re emphasize, like we were talking about in the first segment, that there is a more proactive role for the supervisor in terms of working with the, collaboratively with the officer. Yes. OK. We'll, go, we'll, do, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Um, but now I see you're standing and Steve is sitting. Why is that? Well, one of the things we don't uh, is, is, regar is regard to safety and that there's a cover officer. You know, we, we took out the word home visit because we don't want to turn this into a visit. It's not really a visit. Mm -hmm. And uh, this just gives it more of, I, I think, a formal approach, but still allowing, um, you know, the probation officer pre or pretrial officer and the defendant to establish a good rapport. Okay, very good. I just wanted to make sure we were clear on both of those points. Steve, why don't you go ahead and, and, and conduct the discussion? Great. Uh, Jim, as you know, Mr. Jones, we work for the, for the federal court. And we work for the judge who released uh, Jim on, on bail in this case. Uh, we, we're going to monitor your compliance with the conditions of release. We also need to know if you need any assistance from us, things like employment, some life skills, anything that we can assist you in. And we want to take care of anything that might prohibit you from uh, complying with all the conditions of release that the judge established uh, last Tuesday when you were released. I got it. Okay. We also need to keep open lines of communication with you, Mr. Jones. We'd like to uh, establish uh, this rapport with you, and uh, if you have any questions, concerns throughout this process, we want you to, to call us and, and have an open dialogue with us. Okay. I understand. Uh, sir, as the third party custodian, you're obligated to inform me if uh, Jimmy does anything that he's not supposed to do that's contrary to those conditions of release. For example, if you know that he's smoking pot, which is obviously a violation of his conditions, you need to call me and let me know that he's done that. Am I going to get in any trouble, something that he might do? No, sir. You, the court can hold you in contempt if you fail to notify us of something you know that he's done that's contrary to the conditions of release. Okay. But so suppose something happens on a Saturday or Sunday. Uh, you guys even open? Our office is closed, but before I leave here today, I'll give you a 
a pager number that's available 24-7, and you can call our office, and we'll be back in touch with you. And like I say, one of the big things I want to do here today is establish means for you to communicate with me. Okay. Uh, now, Jim, you're supposed to submit the random urine samples, report to my office as directed, and uh, complete a substance abuse assessment. Do you have insurance? What, what difference does that make? Well, since Jim has been ordered by the court to do a substance abuse evaluation, our office tries to utilize private insurance, private funds, before we utilize the taxpayer's dollars. It's okay, it's okay Dan. I, I don't have any. Well, I'll give you a number before I leave here today to the County Chemical Dependence Office. Uh, you should call them tomorrow and schedule an appointment. Then contact me with the date and time of that appointment. Uh, also, you'll have to report to my office every other Tuesday between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. Those are our office hours. Since you're not employed right now, that's your work, right? Uh-huh. And you're going to be looking for a job, I know. I put you on a codophone program for urine collection. We, re we discussed that the day you were released, remember? Yep, I'm red. Okay, you got your code down. Good. Right. During your interview, you mentioned that you live here with your, your father, who I've met, uh, your stepmother, and your older brother. Is that still the case? Uh, yes, and my uh, stepsister stays here every once in a while. Okay. Okay, I want to put together a list of everyone who stays here, even though it, even if it's just now and then. Uh, I also need to know the people, what time people will most likely be here in the house. Why? I'm, I'm the one on bond. Yeah, I, I'm aware of that. I have the conditions of release, and I'm, I know what you're required to do. Our concern is that we do conduct unannounced home visits, and I want to know who might be here at any given time when I come by. I've met your father. My intention is to meet other people who live here in the house. I also need the, the phone number and address of your girlfriend, Pam. You're still involved with her, is that correct? Yeah, okay. Thanks. Do either of you have questions? No. No, we, no more. All right, Mr. Jones. Uh, Jimmy's already got my card, but I want to give you my card. Okay, thanks. Contact a lot, me huh? anytime you have any concerns. Thanks. Uh, I'll do that, Steve. Thanks. So I'll see you Tuesday, Jimmy. Tuesday, I'll Great. be there. Okay. And thanks for stopping by and telling uh, Jimmy and I what our obligations are. That's not a problem. Uh, if you have any questions at all, please please give me a call. If if you don't get me, feel free to call my supervisor, Tony. Okay. Safe drive. Great. Right. Thank you. Bye. Excellent. Nice job, guys. Uh, why don't you guys step over here a little bit. Bob, Chris, you've had your 15 minutes. Fame. Thank you guys very much for doing this. Okay, thanks. Um, I want to uh, ask Penny, Penny uh, Wickenheiser uh, on our panel. Um, Penny, could you sort of give us the officer's perspective about what you observed in uh, comparing that home assessment and that whole approach to assessment investigation to the old way that we saw earlier? I really like the new way. I think um, our safety concerns as officers are being met with the gathering of the information, making the collateral contacts with the family, doing the walkthrough of the home versus just standing in the doorway saying, okay, this is it, um, I'll see you next time. I think I like the gathering of the information, the exchange of information, and the kind of the open door policy with the defendant and his family. Okay, and does this differ really very much from how you already do it in your district? Actually, no. Our district um, does do home assessments this way for the most, most of the time. Um, obviously, if you're in an uh, uncomfortable situation and you're alone as an officer, you may not do the walkthrough of the home at this point. But if there are concerns, hopefully this new monograph will reinfor reinforce the fact that you should bring a coworker or supervisor with in order to effectively do the home assessment. Very good. Now I want to uh, go to Jolene Witten in the Northern District of Texas. Uh, Jolene, uh, this is a, a much different approach to doing things, obviously. Let's, let's just address it straight on. This is a much different approach to doing things in terms of what the monograph requires formally than the publication 111. And I think it'll strike a lot of people in the field, frankly, as quite invasive, uh, especially when you think about it in light of the least restrictive conditions. So can you, can you speak to that at all? Sure. Um, first of all, I think you noticed in this scenario that the officer and the supervisor were careful to still be respectful of the defendant and his father. 
Um, and also, we need to keep in mind that the term least restrictive refers to the conditions of release that were set. Our supervision strategies, as Tony mentioned earlier, are to be proportionate to the risk. And I think in this case, um, the supervision strategies are proportionate. Okay. So least restrictive conditions does not necessarily translate directly into least restrictive strategies, correct? That's correct. Tony, reactions to that? Well, I think it's important, uh, as Jolene uh, mentioned, you have to make sure if you, if you adequately assess something that your risks are in line with, with that assessment. Uh, and the strategy that you put in place, and it's very important to do that. If you don't adequately assess a case and the risk factors, your strategy will not be in line with no, what's necessary to manage the risk. Okay, and good. And you always want to make yeah, sure that those conditions are released, the, the interventions that you impose are within the conditions of release. Sure, okay. Thanks for making that point. Uh, hence, I wanted to just sort of get the, the Chief's perspective on what we've observed here. And again, the, con the contrast between the old and the new. What are your reactions? When the committee was reviewing the process, one of the things we, we absolutely felt needed to happen is our officers needed to perform as professionals. And as you could tell, leaving the card in the door was not a very professional act. And, and it didn't give you any information um, and by which to make an assessment on what conditions would be appropriate, what strategies would be appropriate, and how you were going to get this person uh, from release through post-conviction or conviction if, if necessary. What we had hoped was that our officers would perform at a level far, we raised the bar, I guess, is, is where we were. We, we wanted our officers to perform better using their own professional skills, their skills of assessing these defendants and, and what things were necessary. It came to be, as you could see from the second uh, scenario, uh, that there was a lot more information. The relationship that they had developed with the father already establishes how this is going to go. The father is on board, understands what's the expectations, and so does the defendant. Uh, they also know that we're coming to the home, that we are going to hold them accountable, but we're also there as a resource. The professionalism of our officers is what we had hoped to gain from this. Very good. Now, uh, just to sort of uh, bring it back around here to what we were talking about in the first segment. I mean, there's a clear community orientation. There's a clear emphasis on continuing assessment. Now, what we didn't see was the post-release intake interview, right, guys? I mean, you know that's going to happen. So this isn't the first time you're going to be seeing uh, the defendant, right? I mean, as the officer. No, and, ho and hopefully we've established rapport with the father and the defendant at the time the post-release intake interview right. and made some collateral contacts as well. Right, so this is simply a follow-on to that. And again, sort of by raising the bar, it sort of takes that community, it gets you out into the community and sort of does it in a consolidated, efficient way. Tony? And I think another thing to keep in mind is when you're in the, when the, uh, the defendant's home, after their first release, sometimes they're very nervous. They're not right. hearing things as clearly as they would in an environment like this when they're more relaxed uh, in their own home. Very good. Uh, I want to move on to our second act, which will uh, focus on the uh, six-month supervision plan uh, evaluation. But before we do that, Dennis Spitzer, New York City, why don't you just summarize for us what, we, what we've observed here? Well, a lot of, a lot of good things happened. Um, we saw not only the verification of the defendant's residence and who else is, uh, is living at the residence, but potential hazards with the dog were identified, potential supervision issues, uh, Tony noticing the beer bottles outside, that was, that was addressed. Um, uh, also the collateral contacts, uh, establishing the rapport with the, uh, not only the defendant, but the father as third-party custodian and uh, establishing that, those collateral contacts and possibly laying the groundwork for future collateral contacts with Steve requesting the, the girlfriend's telephone number, so we assume he's going to follow up with that, um, and setting the tone for the supervision presence that uh, to expect the un, unannounced field visits from time to time. So I think all those things um, were excellent, actually, and, uh, and provide for uh, 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 a collaborative approach in terms of supervision. Excellent. Uh, let's move on to our second act, looking at the six-month supervision plan evaluation. Uh, Steve, let me ask you to, to step off the set. Uh, and this uh, s first scene, again, we are going to focus on the first, on the old way of doing things, and then we'll show you the new way under the new monograph 111. Uh, in this scene, 
Tony is the supervisor, he is Steve's supervisor, and he's reviewing the files, and lo and behold, he's come across the file of one Mr. James Jones. So Tony, why don't you have a seat here? Good. Um, and we got your little file here, right? No phone calls, you got your calls held, and uh, we're gonna do this the old way, so let's roll them. Go ahead, Tony. Ah, time for case reviews. Okay, let's see what we have here. Um, Jim Jones. I can't. I don't really remember this case. Okay, let's see. It's time to start some counting here. We got to count the UAs. Okay, it's supposed to take three UAs a month for six months. So there should be eighteen. Let me count. Three in April. Three May. June. Three in July. Wait a second. 17 UAs. Hmm. Supposed to have 18. Case plan not properly executed. Okay, let's see what we have next here. Oh, home visits. Okay, one every quarter. Okay, let's see. Hmm. Well, it looks like we only have one home visit, not two as we're supposed to. Case plan again. Not execute it as directed. All right. Hmm, there's got to be a better way than this. Okay. Uh, that's the old way of doing things for the supervisor in his little bubble in his office. Okay. Now, let's bring on the officer. The officer retrieves the file out of earshot and eyeshot of the supervisor. Reactions. Didn't execute case plan. Why is Tony so focused on the frequencies? I'm meeting my goals of the case. Jim's drug free. He's going to treatment. He's reporting as directed. He's so focused on counting the UAs and the home visits that he didn't even notice that the mental health issues that I've been dealing with. I wish there was a better way to do this than all the counting he does. All right. Tony, stay put. Steve can stay right there. I want to uh, first go to Nancy Colon in uh, West Palm Beach, Florida. Nancy, from the supervisor's perspective, give us your reactions to what we've observed here. What's wrong with this picture? Well, I think that with uh, this approach, uh, emphasis is placed on counting uh, the activities rather than looking at the outcome. Uh, you can see the frustration on, on the part of the supervisor and the officer with all you know this counting of activities and. The officer even expresses that the supervisor is not, you know, is focused on the counting and doesn't take note of the issues, which is, you know, mental health issues that this defendant is, is going through. So um, I think this is not a very effective way of, of supervising defendants because the attention seems to be more on the quantity rather than the quality. Mm -hmm. Okay, now two related questions. I mean, we noticed in the dialogue, and we built this into the dialogue, that both said, and specifically the supervisor in this case, said there's got to be a better way. You're a supervisor, you know, and you're, you've been in this position. I mean, do you feel like there's got to be a better way, just truthfully, as a supervisor? Oh, definitely. I mean, this exchange uh, of files back and forth is just not a very effective way. I mean, there's very little communication between the officer and the supervisor, and and um, uh, I feel that for, for years we've been doing it this way, and we've, uh, our, our minds are pretty much embedded in, you know, that they, this is the way that we do supervision by focusing on the activities. But um, with the new monograph, you know, it takes it a step further. You know, now we are to focus on, on, the, on the outcomes, and, and this continuous assessment is what's, what's really important. Very good. Uh, Penny, as our resident uh, line officer expert here, give us your reaction to Steve's reaction. Can you relate? In my, dis is, in my district, um, we have always had an open line of communication with our supervisors, so we've been very fortunate with that. Um, I've always been able to call him. So I can't really relate to the role play. Um, however, I do know that there are districts that can and the, the quantity was such an emphasis and I think everyone will enjoy uh, the new approach in the new monograph 111. Okay, uh, Steve, let me ask you, I mean to some degree uh, what we're trying to get at here is that, and Tony, to some degree the supervisors and the officers behavior 
are a reaction or a result of what was required of them by the publication 111. I, we don't want to portray, uh, our intention certainly was not to portray the officer or the supervisor as antagonistic or lazy or whatever, but that, or as bean counters in, in the case of the supervisor, but as sort of doing what's expected of them and as asked for by the governing monograph. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, th I think one of the things to look at is, is the critical thinking element uh, that an officer has to interject in their position. And if you look, there were 17 UAs. I mean, we're, we're sort of making a fun of it. Sure. But there were 17 UAs. They didn't have the 18, so the, the case plan wasn't executed. Well, if all 17 were negative, <laughs> we didn't even need 12. I mean, maybe, so I mean, that's what we have to get in here is that critical thinking, what is actually happening with the case. And I think it's a, a very important element of the monograph. OK. Um, now let's do the contrast. Let's move on to the next scene and take a look at how the new monograph, um, what the new monograph requires in terms of the supervision plan evaluation. Now we know it used to be called the supervision plan review. We've purposely seen a, a name change here uh, to the supervision plan evaluation. Why don't you guys have a seat? We're now we're going to be in the officer's office, so why don't you, Tony, sit over there. Um, and Steve, move over here behind the desk like you were in the first scene that we did. Let's move the chair back over here. That's okay. Move the chair back over here. Take your take your seats, everybody. Quiet on the set. Live TV. Right. <laughs> Welcome to as supervision turns. Okay. Um, now we're going to see what the new monograph requires and take a look at the interaction. We've got the supervisor sitting in the officer's room. They're going to go over the case files, and we are again focused on the file of James Jones. Why don't you guys take it from here? Ready for your case plan, Steve? I, I, I sure am, Tony. Great. Uh, what do you have today? Uh, the first one I'd like to talk to you is uh, Jimmy Jones. Uh, what's, what's going on with him? Uh, I, I've got some concerns about his emotional stability. I, I, I think he's a, he's a risk to himself and uh, probably a Danger to the community, Tony. Uh, Why is that? Well, I got a call yesterday from his attorney who said that there was an incident at his office, the attorney's office, uh, when Jim came over and made some inappropriate comments about the cost of uh, the legal representation that he's getting in this case that we have. His attorney said his behavior was real erratic. That's not good. No, it sure, sure not. According to his attorney, Jim has acted inappropriately on more than one occasion. He was hesitant to provide me a lot of information about it because of the conflict uh, of him being his attorney and all. Uh, but he did say he called the police and they escorted him out of his office. Well, was he charged with a new offense? Not charged or arrested, but they did give him a citation, uh, a warning actually, for trespass. Uh, his attorney said he was going to be filing a motion to withdraw from the case. Uh, is this the first time Mr. Jones have an incident like this? No, he self-reported some time back, uh, and what he reported uh, concerned me. He was, con he was scheduled for an evaluation, a substance evaluation over at County that I had referred him to, and he missed the appointment. He came by my office the next day, and, and I, I can only characterize his behavior as, as kind of strange. And uh, when I asked him why he missed the appointment, he said he had a feeling that day that something bad was going to happen to him if he went out of his house. So he just stayed home all day. Uh, we rescheduled the appointment, and he subsequently made that appointment, but he was just acting kind of strange that day. Oh, you know, I remember this case, I think. This is the one they had the beer bottles in front of the house, and the father's the third-party custodian. Father's the third-party, and, and got okay. a little bent out of shape when I asked him about the if they had insurance. Remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah. He yeah. seemed like he was a little on edge. But. Right. Uh, yeah, that, that's him. And to top things off, he's no longer allowed on the grounds where the father owns that uh, jewelry exchange store, uh, where they have that booth where his father makes jewelry. Uh, he can't go there anymore because of uh, this case. And he was a bit evasive about when I questioned him about what was going on with that situation, not being able to, to show up at his dad's place of work. Uh, did you talk to the owner at all or no? Uh, yeah, I did. And uh, the owner said that that he had had, that Jones, Jimmy had had several confrontations with customers uh, out and around the, the facility there. Boy, it definitely sounds like he might have some psychological issues. Uh, I noticed he has a drug treatment condition, and uh, you've done several UAs. 
Yeah, I've done quite a few U-rays, Tony, and they, they've all been negative, so that's why I, uh, I asked uh, the, the vendor to reduce them, and we're not taking as many as we were. I called his counselor, Miss Ross, this morning, and she said that, uh, Joan, that, that Jimmy's attending all the meetings, but he's confrontational uh, with staff and kind of uh, difficult to deal with. She thinks he needs to be evaluated for, uh, by a psychologist, psychiatrist. Well, you know, I agree with your assessment. The defendant may be a risk of danger. He could also pose a risk of non-appearance. Yeah, I, I think he does. I, I spoke with his father uh, this afternoon. He's going to bring him by uh, so we can intervene, at least in the short run, and see what's going on with him. He's going to be in at 3 o'clock today. That's a good idea. We definitely need to intervene here. Uh, let's get Joan involved to see what services we can put in place to get him seen by a psychiatrist as soon as possible. That, that makes sense. Uh, let me call Joan while you're here so we can schedule a meeting for the three of us. Joan, can you come down here to, uh, to my office to meet with me and Tony? Thanks. Bye. Nice job, guys. Um, stay put. Let's talk about this for a little bit. Uh, three things to keep in mind here, hopefully, as you were watching. You saw collaboration. You saw a two-pronged approach to managing noncompliance and you saw the supporting roles first of the supervisor and then toward the end we alluded to the supporting role of the specialist. Uh, keep those things in mind during our discussion here. Uh, let me go out to Utah and uh, supervising U.S. Probation Officer Tristan Smart. Tristan, talk a little bit about what we observed here, uh, emphasizing this notion of collaboration and a two-pronged approach. What did you see and what's your experience been in your district with this? Okay. Um, first of all, let me say that the two-pronged approach is how officers should intervene when a defendant fails to comply uh, with his or her conditions of release. And these are um, risk control and risk reduction strategies. Um, I think in this case, we saw the risk control strategy as uh, having the defendant con continue to submit his UAs, whereas the risk reduction strategy would be referring him to a psychiatrist to deal with this. Um, I think in our district, these are these are things, for the most part, we've been doing all along. Um, we've, I think, defined them better now and maybe have it more set in stone with the new monograph. All right. Uh, and now let me go to Jolene. Jolene, uh, in a prior conversation, uh, you talked about that in many districts, this approach is really sort of, in a way, formalizing what was an informal process. Can you, can you speak to that a bit? Yes, um, what I had mentioned earlier is a lot of times these conversations will take place in the hallway, maybe in the lunchroom, uh, just haphazardly talking about defendants and what's going on with them. And this puts it down formally. This is what a supervisor and an officer should do, is to meet periodically, discuss these cases, and, um, and prevent further problems. And the collaboration, as you saw in this case, involved not just the officer and the supervisor, but also the specialist. And um, I think that's an approach that um, is very effective, using the expertise of all the appropriate people in the office, making this a team effort, and not just leaving the officer to deal with situations on his or her own. Excellent. Okay, now we're going to have to wrap this segment up and move to our last segment, where we'll talk about implementation issues and, and strategies. Um, but uh, hopefully we've given you some concrete ideas about how this thing's supposed to work uh, and what some of these practices might look like once you actually do them. Remember, again, keep in mind the big picture, an increased emphasis on the professionalism of the officer and the professionalism of the manager, the supervisor, and upper management. Um, We've noticed in dialoguing with the field over the past several months that there's an emerging concern about time, both on the part of supervisors and officers. Supervisors are concerned with how the heck am I going to have enough time to meet with my officers and collaborate in this way, even if I do want to do it. And officers similarly have that concern of how the heck am I going to find the time to meet with my supervisor uh, when I have all of these cases I need to work, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what we want you to do as we move to our next segment is take a look at these two messages that acknowledge those issues uh, and, uh, and then we'll come back in the last segment and talk about them in terms of implementation challenges and ways you might try to deal with them. Take a look. So what did you think of that supervisor's training? Well, it was interesting. <laughs> what do you mean? Okay, so now they want us to collaborate with our officers and meet with them and do field work with them. 
unbelievable. I know. Like, I'm going to have time to do that. Supervising six officers, each of them with 50 to 60 cases. What are we supposed to do? Like, just fit it in among the bazillion other things we've got going on? And how are the officers supposed to fit it in? Well, something's going to have to give. I mean, it actually sounds like this new approach might work better than how we do things now, if there was time, you know? Think about it. Wouldn't it be great to work more closely with officers on cases? I mean, I kind of miss casework, don't you? Yeah, I do. Some aspects of it, anyway. I guess we better talk to the chief to find out how this is supposed to work. Definitely. Tell you what, I'll call her to try to set up something. So, did you watch that FJTM broadcast on the new 111? I didn't see you there. Yeah, I came in late, but I saw most of it. I guess now we're supposed to sit down with our supervisor on every case. How are we supposed to do that exactly? I don't know about you, but I've got 60 cases. I'm too busy. I know. I don't see how it's going to work. I don't have the time, and my supervisor sure as heck doesn't either. And how are we actually supposed to schedule these meetings? What if we're, like, scheduled to meet on the cases, and then we get a bunch of interviews we have to do? There goes the schedule. Then we have to take more time to reschedule them. Then something will come up, because it always does, and that meeting will go out the window. Yada, yada, yada. Totally. Hey, I've been doing this job a long time. I don't need anybody looking over my shoulder. Uh, don't get me wrong. I personally think it'd actually be a good thing to have a chance to sit down with my supervisor to work through case issues together. She's pretty good at that stuff, but we just never have the time to do it. It's frustrating. Yep. I think we better find out how this thing is supposed to work. Welcome back again. In this final segment, we talk about implementation, implementation challenges and ways to meet them. Uh, as we alluded to coming out of the prior segment of the role plays, you know, there are going to be many challenges as you think through how this thing is supposed to work. Uh, change is difficult. Um, let's talk uh, first, hence, about the time issue because it clearly is a concern among a lot of districts and officers, supervisors, because they haven't many had a chance to sort of think about how this is supposed to work or tr experiment with it yet in their districts. How's it, talk about how it's worked in your district and what your role's been. The first thing for us was the commitment to do it. It, it wasn't negotiable. We were going to pilot test the process and how did it work and, and what were the challenges, what were the issues. The first one was we're going to do this. So from that, uh, what I did is I allowed my deputy chief and Steve and our other supervisor to come up with how could they best formulate a plan to where their time would be available to the officers for this process. Uh, initially it was tough. What they tried were regular office hours to do this in and, and there were interruptions. They chose to go to a seven o'clock time once a week with each officer uh, for, their, for their review time. Uh, amazingly it worked and, and, and it works well. What we found is that officers at the initial meeting did not come prepared, uh, felt that this was a gotcha or they were out to get them uh, with this face-to-face -face meeting with the supervisor because historically when the supervisor came to your office something was wrong. Um, they moved to a neutral point which was a conference room. They decided that they would let the officer lead the discussion and what they found in their second and third meetings with the officers, they came absolutely prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, they prepared a checklist of things the officers should have reviewed prior to doing the assessment or doing the case review uh, and the officers were prepared. I mean, it, we found that the officers welcomed the opportunity to come in and meet with the supervisors as it said in the little uh, vignette to meet with the, officer, the supervisor and explain how well they were in fact doing and how much they did in fact know about their cases. Okay, so uh, there was, this was a thoughtful implementation process, not a willy-nilly kind of thing, although it was a difficult thing for, uh, look, let's not, you know, sugarcoat it. It was a hard thing, <laughs> right, Steve, uh, to implement and change is difficult and you've, you ran into, into resistance yes. when you tried to do it. But I think your role it was key. It was the commitment to do it. Yes. Uh, Dennis Spitzer, let me uh, ask you, just again as a chief, what, what is the role of the chief and the upper management in making sure that this thing happens? 
Well, as you mentioned, and it's been mentioned before, change is hard. And uh, I think it's the role of the chief and the deputy to, to evaluate the operations to make it happen and provide the time so that the supervisors and the officers can sit down and discuss these things. If it makes uh, it necessary to change rotation or, or certain days to be put aside to do this, then, then that's what it takes. And each district is different, and each, we each face our own individual uh, problems and circumstances. But if there's a willingness, I think it can be done. Okay. Um, Tony, let me ask you, uh, what kind of, uh, have you had similar kinds of experiences in your district? You all have been trying to, again, implement this approach. What's the experience been like? I think one of the keys, and we've been uh, starting to implement the 109, uh, at least in the planning stages, I think it's very important that you involve the officers in that because they're ultimately going to be the ones that drive the, the new monograph along with the supervisors. And I think they need to work together and to bring up the issues and to confront those issues. I think if you try to, you know, gloss over the issues that come up in the monograph, you're not going to really do, um, you're not going to do justice for your organization. Okay. So. You've empowered the officers by uh, uh, enabling them to take part in the process of the change. Yes, we recently had a meeting which involved some officers who volunteered with the supervisor. We went over chapter by chapter of the 109. We'll do the same thing with the 111 when we kick that off. And, and there were some issues that came up. There were some disagreements between some officers, officers and supervisors, but we're working through those, and uh, I think we're going to be a better organization for doing that. Okay, so really the challenge is to uh, include officers to the extent possible in the change process and empower, empower them that way, give, let them have some input. Uh, let them know that this isn't about getting them, you know, but that this is just going to be, there's a new sheriff in town, there's a new way of doing things, okay? And that we're all in it together because I gather you're going to get some resistance from supervisors who've been yes. doing the counting for some time too because they, they're evaluated in a certain way and they're used to doing it and they might feel threatened if they have to do it a different way, no? Now that you're a supervisor, you know, can you relate? Yeah. Sure. This is a cooperative sure. effort, though. Right. I mean, when, when the officer and the, the supervisor sit down, the officer can make suggestions, hopefully uh, bring some things to the table that the officer hadn't considered, let the officer make the decision, and that the supervisor hopefully will feel comfortable enough that the officer made the right decision. And it's not going to be a situation where the officer writes down what they're going to do and the supervisor puts down what they should do. It's a cooperative effort, and the document that's finalized you should speak to what both of them can live with and okay. it's a cooperative process. All right so hence and Dennis mentioned sort of this notion of commitment Steve alluded to it uh, now Steve has also alluded to this notion of teamwork you know uh, a cooperative effort so we've got commitment teamwork and since it's change implicit in that is flexibility flexibility on the part of management flexibility on the part of officers uh, sort of gradually working through some of this. Did you want to say something? Well, I, I think one of the things it, to keep in mind is, as you implement the process is that there will thing, things will come up like frequencies, and, and the supervisors may look at that differently than an officer may because they're so used to doing that. But I think you have to get the mindset out there that you know this is a new way of doing things and try to get uh, people to be open to that. Okay. Uh, now, Penny, I'll get to you in the second hands. <laughs> Don't be too aggressive. <laughs> Penny, what, tell us, you know, based on what you've been hearing here, um, you know, your district is just contemplating the implementation of it, but has a similar way of approaching supervision anyway. So what do you take from this discussion? Um, I like that it's going to be formalized. I like that it is going to be the standard practice and not just the way that we get to do it in our district. And so I, I really like that if I'm doing a courtesy supervision for another uh, district that that district will also have the same standards or similar standards to us. And we're not picturing that all of us are going to have to do exactly the same thing. Each district will be able to waver a little bit. But this does set some really good outlines, some minimal standards for everyone to meet. So I'm excited about the, the product to come forward. You raised an excellent point, and that was something that I intended to raise earlier and, and, and perhaps glossed over it, and that is that we acknowledge, we've got people here from all different districts on this panel, even though we're speaking as sort of as part of the national system. We've got people on the phone from several different districts. I think six or seven different districts are represented here. Districts do things differently. There are different trends. There are different approaches. The, the monograph sets a standard. And then you're going to have to implement the, the, the monograph in a way that works in your district culture. And 
you know, there's only we can only help you with that to some degree. I mean, you know your district culture better than we do, and and you know you said that this kind of approach will work in your district, and you're going to have to be attuned to what ever your district needs. Now, I, I, we only have a couple minutes left in the segment. I want to briefly go out to Tristan Smart in Utah. Tristan, I know you guys have been implementing this approach as well. What are, could you just sort of briefly tell us what your experiences have been and, 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 and just bring us full circle here? Sure. Um, we've been impl implementing many aspects of this for probably the past year and a half now. Mm -hmm. um, I think that our officers have welcomed the change. There's more of a focus on the defendant's behavior now rather than on the officer's behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that contributes to this idea of professional collaboration between a supervisor and officer. Um, we have had some challenges in implementing the 111. I think one of the, the biggest ones, interestingly, is uh, getting the home assessment done. Mm -hmm. um, because we're not just leaving a card in the door anymore, it, they've had some difficulty actually making contact with the defendant and, and getting the assessment done. So I've told them that they can schedule appointments for home assessments in you know, rural and outlying areas. That's um, a, that, that brings up a really important point, again, uh, indicating the differences among districts because we've got urban districts, we've got rural districts, we've got supervision issues that are particular to rural districts where you've got long distances, you know, and doing those home assessments, particularly in a district like Utah, the entire state of Utah, the entire state of New Mexico, the entire state of Minnesota, I mean, sure, there are some urban areas, but you've got to really make an effort. So what else did you want to, to, to add, Tristan? Um, just that, we, you know, we've done things like in, in not only um, are we no longer doing the bean counting with uh, home visits in UAs, but we discontinue counting field hours. Mm. We're, we're making sure the officers are, are doing need-based supervision and instead of meeting a minimum number of field hours. And I really think they, they, they feel like they're being treated more like the professionals they are. Very good. Um, okay, we need to move on. Uh, we're moving quickly here. Uh, bear with us. You guys sit tight. Um, we know that there is a lot of interest in the field in hearing about the technical assistance that's available from the AO. So we wanted to uh, show you an interview that I did recently with Nancy Beatty, the Chief of Policy and Communication at the AO Office of Probation and Pretrial Services, who talks about just that, um, technical assistance and the expectations of the AO. So take a look. Nancy, thanks for being here. You're welcome. First question is, when are districts expected to have completely implemented the principles of Monograph 111? We recognize that implementation is a process, and it's not something we can put a, a drop-dead date on. So what we've done is asked districts to appoint a supervision point of contact in the district, and we've asked that person to develop an action plan that will spell out for us what parts of the monograph they can implement at what stage, because it really is something that can happen in stages. We're asking that that action plan be submitted to Barbara Meyerhofer in OPPS by the end of November, November 30th. Okay, now what supporting documents are available on the JNET to help districts as they develop their action plan? Okay, well the monograph itself of course is there, but there are also other pieces. One is a summary of changes, which specifically shows what's new about this monograph, this 111. Another is a list of references to the research that were used in developing this monograph. And then there are three other pieces that are, would be helpful for supervisors to implement and move forward with some of these changes. They are all on the OPPS webpage um, under the section called Clearinghouse and then Publications Monographs. Okay. Um, now, either in the development of their action plans or uh, for some other reason, if folks in the district should have questions, where should they go? Okay, first they should speak with their point of contact in their own district. If that doesn't settle the issue or if it's the point of contact who has the question, uh, they should contact, first we've set up an email hotline that's at AODB underscore Supervision Outreach Services. And that will be something we, we check daily and we, we get responses back within 24 hours or so to the person asking the question. That should be that, that should be the first couple of places people go. If there's still issues, though, or they want a conversation, sometimes these things aren't simple questions, um, they should call the regional administrator. Okay, just to wrap it up, what else should folks in the district know as they continue to develop their action plans and implement the monograph? 
Well, there were about three and a half years of work that went into this um, and involved a lot of input from people throughout the courts. Uh, we're, we're making a commitment to keep it updated, though, because we know that even though it's the latest and greatest at the moment, there will be changes or there will be things that happen in the implementation process that we didn't foresee. So we're going to work on collecting feedback throughout the year and updating it annually. We're also going to bring in the, some of those points of contacts to have discussions about things that have worked really well and things that have been a little more difficult. So we think that by getting input and keeping it um, updated, we'll really have a better product. Excellent. Thank you, Nancy. Oh, you're welcome. Happy to be here. All right. We've covered a lot of ground in this short 90 minutes, but keep in mind our purpose here was only to introduce the monograph to you and highlight some of the more uh, salient points. Um, the new monograph clearly requires some major shifts in how many of us think about uh, conducting pretrial supervision. And these shifts aren't going to take place overnight. Uh, they're going to take time. Um, so again, as the spots you saw before emphasized, make the time to understand both what's in the monograph, the mechanics, but also the bigger picture that emphasizes the professionalism of the officer and the professionalism of the supervisor. Um, the participant guide that accompanies this broadcast suggests some things you can do in your district in terms of in-district training to, uh, to do a little bit more discussing uh, and helping you think about ways of implementing the monograph that are attuned to your district culture. Um, take a look at them. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to contact me here at the center. But for now, I'd like to thank our panelists. Uh, both here in the studio and on the telephone. Thank you guys very much, and thanks to our folks on the telephone. Steve, Steve, Tony, thanks for being here. Thanks to Bob Fagan, Chris Wagenseller, Barbara Meyerhofer from the AO, who was part of the planning group. Especially thanks to John Hughes and Nancy Beatty for their participation and support in the program. And finally, thanks to you for watching. Don't forget to send us your evaluations and rosters. We want to know who is here and what you thought. We'll see you next time.